Hey, Hudson Valley, this Saturday, February 29th, it's Leap Day. Uh, a once in a four year occurrence. Once in a quadrano? I was trying to say like a quadrilogy, but like, a, I don't know. You mean a quattro formaggio? That's exactly mm, what I meant. Pizza. Leap year, leap day. This year, we've got something really fun planned. Uh, we partnered up with our good friends over at WRRV 92.7, 96.9. FM. WRRV. Where you can hear us on Monday nights doing some really stupid shit at about 620. Yeah. But uh, we partnered up, and we're going to have a live performance in the store. Uh, starting around 1 o'clock, come hang out with WRV, win some prizes, and come see the band Magic Giant, who will be in the store performing on our stage for free. Freezies. That's right. So you get to come on by, hang out, win some stuff, shop some tunes, hear some great tunes, and not just that, but they'll be doing a meet and greet. You can meet the band, talk to them. Don't get all stalkery. Just putting that out there. And I know what you're thinking. Like, ah, what what did I do on Saturday? You weren't doing shit on Saturday. You know why? Because this is a bonus Saturday. You didn't have any plans. This Saturday is given, not earned. Come on. Unless you planned this four years ago, in which case, well If, if you're having a wedding today, or that day, <laughs> this Saturday, that's on yeah. you. But the rest of you slackers, you weren't planning anything. And we'll see you on Saturday. Have you checked out the new Dark Side Records smoke shop located inside of Dark Side Records? We got everything that you need, from glass to papers, accessories like pokers and grinders. Grinded. Stop on by for all your smoke and smoke accessory needs. Hey, Internet. March 21st. Patch Adam returns. That's right. The in-store punk rock patch pin what have you event we named after the lovable 90s movie starring Robin Williams. Wait, what? I named it after a radioactive man's catchphrase in The Simpsons. You made that up. Up and at them. Up and at them. Patch at them. Oh, whatever. Doesn't Mr. Burns control the the nu- Just nu- move nuclear. on. It's March 21st. It's Patch Adam. That's right. We got some DIY vendors. They got cool shit. They got patches. They got pins. They got candles. They got shirts. They've got all the accoutrement. Your little crusty heart desires. And not just that, we're having a book drive here. That's come right. bring some books, new and used, all ages, whatever. If you've got some books, come and donate them. They're all going to go to the Duchess Pride Center's new lending library. How cool. Yeah. So come do some good, find some cool shit, and hang out with us. That's going on from 12 to 5 on Saturday, March 21st. See you there. Now let's get to the podcast. This is the Dark Side Records and Gallery Podcast. <laughs> Sit down very carefully. Oh, man. Oh, my little bougie butt. So sore. Aw. <laughs> I went skating with Jenny. Ice skating? N- roller. Rinking? R- I went I went rinking, yeah. Mm. Skin him a rinky dinky dink. <laughs> I went... Uh, you skinny me rinked your dude, didn't you? <laughs> Uh, I think I did more. I was more of a rinky dink. No, that's my nickname in the roller derby scene. <laughs> I actually did have a uh, roller derby name if I ever went into roller derby. Already yeah. picked out. It was going to be Tom Sawyer twenty one twelve R A P Neil Peart. Uh, but it was going to be spelled like soy because it was going to be a vegan uh, thing. Uh, okay, I thought they were always like quasi sexual or suggestive. I think they're just puns. Okay, it's just as long as it's a pun mm. and not someone's legal name. I might have to, if I was going to do it, I might choose a name from like my list of funny names for my penis. Do you keep that list? I do. It's on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I think of a good one, I just kind of put it in there. All right. I guess that's the equivalent. I have a band name list on my phone. Yeah, same. So, s- same thing. <laughs> Let's see if there's any crossover. <laughs> what's uh, what's the latest penis name you put on your list uh, there, uh, JJ? Let me get my notes app open here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. You want the latest one? Yeah, the most recent. Yakov Smirnob. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Oh, this one. You'll love this one because you just listened to the podcast and we were talking about it. Uh huh. Frank Loin Wright. <laughs> oh, no. 
These are good. These I are good. that's why I keep a list. Well, these could also be your derby names. Uh, I also have. I ha- seem to have a band name. Well, I'll no, t- I only have one in here. I'll tell you my most recent band name that I put in here. Okay, it, it was Trigger Treat. <laughs> Sounds like an all right band. No, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was supposed to be like, you know, trick or treat, but for people with trigger warnings. Right. Or the specific lips. <laughs> <laughs> the only band name on my band name list currently is mm-hmm. Egregious Philbin. Oh, that's good. That's good. Copyright internet. <laughs> Along with Jakob Smirnoff. But yeah, so I'm, I, I'm here and my butt is sore because I, uh, I went to a roller derby skating thing with Jenny. It was... Uh, uh, the final free skate night at the castle in Goshen, New York. <laughs> Which, if you've never been to, I haven't. It's pretty rare. Actually, you should take the twins there. I don't even actually know where Goshen is. Uh, it's over the river, through the woods. On the way to Grandma's house? On the way to Walden. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, on, on Golden Pond. Got it. Okay. But uh, it's like got a whole a huge arcade. It's got like a restaurant and a bar and mini golf and all this other shit. Whole but thing. They, they had a uh, they had a skating rink, and I guess they're getting rid of it. And last night was the final night of skating, so all the roller derby folks all came out and like hung out and skated. And I hmm. tried skating for the second time in my life. <laughs> Took a pretty fucking mean spin. <laughs> uh, fell on my ass, and now I have a bruised tailbone. What song was it to? Um. I don't know, but the song after I got up and continued skating was Tom Sawyer. Oh. Yeah. So it's like it was meant to be. You're more of a Tom Sawyer. <laughs> See? Sorry. That's if, I, <laughs> that's if I wanted to make my derby name not vegetarianism related. Mm. Mm. Like pain related or Canadian. Tom Sawyer. Is it French Canadian? It doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So we're here. Um... Hey, internet! <laughs> oh no, that's the wrong thing. Oh, uh, I guess we could we start with a hey internet. I'll go, we usually hey. Internet. Okay, go. Hey, internet! Welcome to the Dark Side Records podcast. This is, of course, a podcast brought to you by the good folks at Dark Side Records, located at six eleven Duchess Turnpike in, in Poughkeepsie. Poughkeepsie, or on the web at darksiderecords.com. <laughs> Uh, this is a uh, monthly podcast uh, where we like to talk about a range of topics, including music, the music industry, uh, craft beers, and papal schmears, and sore butts. <laughs> yeah. Very sore. So if you hear me groaning in the podcast, that's 100% what it is, and I'm really sorry. Should I have brought my home speculum collection? No, but an I, exam? I would have taken a donut for sure. Oh. Wait, wait, hold on. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm backing up first. <laughs> <laughs> you have a home speculum collection? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. What was your backup? Uh, you're eating donuts, huh? No, for my butt. Oh, like Not a, the, yeah, like you know, a hemorrhoid pillow. You know, like, I have no experience. That's actually that's my move when I take a long flight. Is I take I bring one of those <laughs> neck pillows. Oh God, I was gonna say you bring a a hemorrhoid no. donut. <laughs> <laughs> that guy on the plane, and I make a real loud scene about it. You know, <laughs> it's actually a sits bath, and you have a little trickle of running water on your asshole while you fly. It switches on landing and takeoff, and I only sit in the middle seat every time. <laughs> no, I take those neck pillows. You know, those ones you get that you wrap around so you can sort of sleep. Yeah, and halfway through my butt gets sore, so I'll stick that and I'll sit on that. It's like a, it's like sit- not a bad move. Sitting on a donut. Yeah. Sitting on a donut. How do you feel about the recline on the airplane? Never enough. And also, that's when I start getting kicked, usually. When you recline? Yeah. Yeah, because you should never recline. <laughs> it shouldn't be an option, and you shouldn't recline. I do like a half recline. No. I never go full recline. There's never, there's like never anything recline. acceptable in a recline. If there was no one behind you, that's an acceptable recline. Well, maybe that brings up an important part. you got to look behind you first. But you there's can't just blind recline. There's very much always... Like, I can't think of a flight where... I've had, like... In recent years, maybe two flights where there was no one next to me, but I'm not sure I've ever had no one behind me. Okay. I've had, you know, like small people behind me. And I've also, I've definitely had a flight where somebody like put their knees up against the back of uh, my chair and was super high, And then I fucking reclined the shit out of that flight the whole time. Yeah. It's just, what could everybody be courteous? I know. Just, it, that, they should eliminate the recline. 
humans. We're yeah. The, we're the worst. For real. Just common courtesy. You don't recline. Fight me, internet. Leave a comment. <laughs> I like don't blind recline. Don't blind look, recline? Yeah, look back. Yeah. Make sure you got room to recline before you do it. Yeah, that's fine. Sometimes it's, you can, like, I'll, I'll, like, look back and make eye contact and be like, hey, I'm going to do the thing. And I, and then I they, go, just a disapproving shake, like, <laughs> fuck. I could handle a disapproving shake, you see? I would, I would respect the <laughs> space, and I'd be like, cool. Well, you would respect it, or cool. you would do it anyway? No, I would respect it. Oh. All right. Well, so. f- I mean, that's fair enough, but. Nobody asks. They just do. Always. Yeah. And Always. every t- every goddamn time on a plane is... I love those photos on the internet of people, like, you know, on a plane, like, taking a selfie, and there's, like, a foot sticking through the chair, like, from <laughs> behind them. A bare-ass foot next Wait, to wasn't face. this a thing, like, last week or the week before, some guy was, like, being a total douche and just punching the chair in front of him the entire time? Uh, I, I didn't see that one. I, yeah, it was some internet it thing. sounds totally Like, plausible. this person had reclined their seat. And so the person behind the recline, rather than just deal with it angrily internally like the rest of us, Ugh. was literally just going like, bump, bump, bump. It was, I don't know, it was a 30 or 45 second video of him just repeatedly punching the seat. Wow. Wow. Humans, man. We're fucked up. We're the worst. And the best. Anyway, you wanna you wanna try a little beer here? Yeah, let's cracker. Sure, cool. I've got a can here. Uncle Cracker over here. This is nope. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna, every time you open a beer, it's it's more, oh, old Uncle Cracker. It's more of a kid slipping rock. away. <laughs> uh, I've got a beer here uh, from Millhouse Brewing right down the road here in Poughkeepsie. Uh, I got one we're gonna try. It's the Kettle Soured Ale that mm. they were kind enough to drop off. They actually dropped off a couple different flavors the other day here. Yeah. And just wanted to say thank you to Millhouse for coming by and, and giving us samples. Here we go. Thanks, Millhouse. Nice, nice uh, release, and uh, you dribble a little. Mm-hmm. Beer review over. <laughs> <laughs> it's all just about crack at the top. That's it's the a, only. It's a lovely color. That's the only part we care about in the review, is the can quality. It is. It's purple. It's a sour. It's bla- uh, it's aged on blackberries, right? It says conditioned on black bear, blackberry conditioned singular. Eight, one blackberry? One blackberry. Wow. To the whole thing. It's a potent berry. <laughs> Is there a local Wonka who's responsible mm-hmm. for this? Mm-hmm. You can really taste the snozberries. <laughs> Cheers. Che- Cheers. Hold on. We should probably use cans for this. That's plastic doesn't against metal right there. Yeah, it doesn't sound any better. Mmm. I do like a sour. Oh, God. <laughs> So puckery. <laughs> it's not bad, but it's so puckery. It's it's definitely sour. Ooh. Yeah, we served uh we served a couple of mill houses at previous events here at Darkside. I wanna say our anniversary party, we had a Millhouse Kolsch. That's right. That was that on was, tap. Most recently was the Kolsch. And uh yeah, that's the thing, without having the full time bar. It's hard to go deep on the selection because you mm-hmm. like gotta you gotta have the crowd pleaser always. Mm-hmm. But uh, if we actually get spoiler alert, the <gasps> old uh, the old dark side hi fi cafe in the front of the store or the back of the store, depending on how you want to look at it, mm-hmm. we'll have a full selection of beers on tap, on bottle, on cask. Uh, are casks oh, still be, a thing? That'd be cool. I don't know if that's still are, a thing. Yeah. It, I, I mm-hmm. feel like they were really popular like five years ago. If only there was somebody here that could tell us about the popularity of beer. More of a cask of Montezuma kind of guy. Oh. oh. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> he likes it. It's almost vomity, but it tastes good. It what is does that v- say about me? <laughs> <laughs> you know how I like my beers? Vomity, but good. But fruity. So anyway, so we're here uh, for a special, we're going to do a little shorty episode for y'all here uh, this week. Ride with me. This month. Uh, it's February 2020. What do you call this month? <laughs> it really hurts to laugh. It really <laughs> hurts my butt to laugh. Uh, this month, of course, after January is February. Okay, that's better. What did you hear? Uh, what did I say? I, I, the first time was like February or, I don't know, it was... We have to, we'll have to roll back on the tape here. F- February. Can I get an instant replay? Here we go. Now. Uh, it's February. I think it sounds fine. See, not, you, no, it's come close. on, internet. You agree with me? 
It's my sore butthole. That's what it is. <laughs> it's, re- it's coming up below. You've sent the pain below, just like suffocating. <sighs> and now you're seeing red. Ag- I don't. This is all the Chevelle references I have. Cut my life into pieces. That's man. the roach. <laughs> don't roast the roach. You end up in Joe's apartment. I watched Joe's apartment recently. Uh, some, some of the movie Joe's apartment, right? Which was there a show? The, that's what it came from. Was oh, it an M- MTV movie. TV show? Yeah. Okay. In fact, I believe it was like before MTV had the shows. It was like a short oh. on MTV, hmm. like a five minute long thing, and they ended up. So you know what this will be good as a feature length movie. <laughs> you know what people want to say? Two hours of cockroaches. <laughs> it's the naked lunch all over again. And what was that guy's name who was in it? Jerry. Um, Candelar. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Not McGuire. Um, Jerry O'Connell. Oh. Oh. O'Connell. Yeah, Jerry O'Connell was the main lead in the theatrical version Weird. of Joe's apartment. Weird. Mm-hmm. He looks like a uh, very skinny Hugh Grant. I think Hugh Grant is already very skinny. Spoiler Hugh Grant. alert, I'm not good with celebrities. Okay. Is that a Firth? You are just lumping all British people together. I am. Into I one am. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Let me. So, anyway, so we're here because uh, something kind of cool happened. Yeah. Uh, a couple weeks back. I'd say so. Yeah. Well, let me sip another, dig a little sip, sip of the gooch. Good word usage. All right. Here we go. So, uh, yeah, I. Got interviewed for Rolling Stone magazine. That's awesome. It was pretty cool. Uh, I would say that, like, you know, uh, 14-year-old me was really excited for me. Uh, If it's any consolation, uh, 40-year-old me was very excited for you. Yeah. We still have yet to find out if it's going to print. Yes. So it's currently, the article is digital only. If somebody has a copy of Rolling Stone with that article in it, bring one in for us. Let's see it. Yeah, it'd be cool. I should probably go get a copy, or well, at least I mean, go investigate a copy. <laughs> Look, I'm doing what I can here. I'm going to go to the competition for that. So, yeah. You know, oh. I'm going to put on my trench coat. Like Carmen Sandiego? Mm-hmm. Only had a red fedora. I bet Birdo does. <laughs> if anybody I know has got a red fedora, it's Birdo. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, as you may have heard us talk about, either on this podcast or videos or social media in some respect or other articles that I have contributed to. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole thing's going to pot, as my grandmother would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we've been dealing with this little matter around these parts and in indie retail. Uh, so last April, I, I feel like I'm going to paint the whole picture here. So. Mm-hmm. We buy the stuff, like the new stuff that we sell in the stores, from the labels. So, particularly the big ones being Warner Brothers, Sony, and Universal. And so, the way distribution works is you order from them, and then they have like a third party warehouse that they pay in order to ship us that product when we order it. So, what was happening was Warner Brothers was in this warehouse called Technicolor. And some contracts came up and yada, yada, yada. They ended up moving to the same warehouse that uh, Universal and Sony Music were already distributed from called DirectShot. Mm -hmm. And DirectShot is in Indiana. They have one location. And it's this massive warehouse. Like I, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of square feet. But basically when Warner moved over, it just broke the camel's back. So suddenly they were distributing two of the biggest labels, and then they had the third biggest label in. And at the same time, uh, Target stores who carry minimal amounts of music, but still there's a significant number of Target stores, decided that they were no longer going to ship music from that warehouse to their distribution centers. They wanted all of their music drop shipped weekly directly to the stores. So at the same time that Warner Brothers moves, there's an extra 3,000 shipments a week for all the targets in the st- in the U.S. And it just put a real strain on everything that was happening. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, weird shit started happening. <laughs> like, um, we, I, you know what? I'm a little sad that we never got anything crazy. Like, uh, I've heard of stores getting uh, 
windshield wiper fluid instead of records. And uh, in fact, this Rolling Stone article mentions uh, a third party distributor who got a shipment of cough syrup. Um, I know that the same, they also distribute for other companies, including kayaks. So I'd always had my fingers crossed that a kayak would show up because that would just be fucking hilarious. Mm-hmm. But uh, we have gotten some empty boxes shipped. So literally a box that's been taped up. And had a, a sticker slapped on it, Dark Side Records, 611 Dutch Turn Bike in Poughkeepsie. And then you uh, slice and dice, ain't nothing but a piece of paper in the box telling you what should have been there, Wow, but wasn't. And that Rolling Stone article, I should point out, if you go to rollingstone.com, you can find it. The title of the article is called The Whole System Collapsed. Inside the Music Industry's Ongoing Distribution Crisis. Uh, just for reference, it came out on February 12th. February 12th. February, yeah. Of this month. Mudflaps Farquhar. <laughs> and it was uh, put together by Elias Leet. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, uh, Elias reached out to me, and um, we ended up having a nice little chat on the phone for a while. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I was curious to see the final product, and basically... He just sort of went and put the story together from all sides of the industry. From uh, the person I mentioned with the cough syrup is the like a head guy at a company called Ingram Entertainment. That's a third party distributor. They talked to me. They talked to uh, Terry Courier of Music Millennium in Portland. They talked to Mike from Homer's in Omaha, Nebraska. They talked to John down at Waterloo in Austin. Wait, I got that backwards. No, I got it right. John. At Waterloo Records in Austin. I kept thinking I meant to say Texas, but Austin, Texas. I think you know there's one Austin. And that's, of course, Patty Austin. (laughs) Uh, If there's any other stores they spoke to in here, I can't remember. I'm sorry. But, yeah, so they just sort of uh, put together the whole picture of. So starting last April when this happened, everything started to arrive a little slower, take a little longer than it did or should, honestly. So... Uh, it started with maybe just a new release here or there. It would, instead of coming, most of the time our new releases come on either Wednesday or Thursday for a Friday street date. Mm-hmm. And maybe it would come on Friday or a couple times it would come on Monday or Tuesday. And we're like, okay. It, it never was, at the beginning, wasn't a big deal. Usually it wasn't like the big name titles or, you know, most of our customers are pretty cool. Like, sorry, it just hasn't shown up yet. Mm-hmm. And uh, then it started to get into not just new releases, but our restock orders. So, like, you know, the bread and butter of the store, the things, your, you know, your Sabbath catalog, your Rolling Stones catalog, all the sort of, like, stuff that stocks the store that's not featured in front line new releases every week. That stuff, you know, usually if we placed an order, let's say, on a Monday or a Tuesday, and it's a couple hundred pieces, we'd get that order, let's say... Seven to ten days later. So sent electronically over. Whoever processes it sends it to the distribution center. Distribution packs it up, gets it out to us. So that was the norm. And then all of a sudden it was taking two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And then we it seriously got to the point where we're talking eight to ten weeks for a restock order, which is crazy. It's no way to run a business and no way to – uh, have the stock that people want on a timely basis. So it forces us to change our whole strategy for everything. Yeah. The other yeah. part of the puzzle is there's these things called one stops. So wherever possible, we try to order directly from the labels and the, the major labels. But then there is all these, these other wholesales in the middle who kind of have everything under one roof. So Warner Brothers would only have Warner Brothers product and Sony would only have Sony product and Merge would only have Merge product. But these one stops in the middle, they have everything. So obviously the way that works is they buy it and then they mark it up a little bit for us to buy it and then have it in the store. So that's what we started having to do is buy from them more because they would have the stock when the others couldn't get it to us because they're actually good at shipping things to us. You know, I place an order and Two days later, here it is. So then uh, I think it seemed obvious to most people that that affects cost of things because 
they're not passing the same price on because they have to buy it too. So then, you know, we have to pay a little bit more for it. And then we have to also try to protect what we're doing. We don't want to raise our prices on anybody. Mm -hmm. But every now and then you got to make an adjustment of a dollar or two here and there because of this. And then the whole thing keeps snowballing and snowballing, getting worse and worse. So eventually we reach the point where they say, hey, stop ordering from us, the the majors we're talking about. Mm-hmm. They're like, I, I, you know, I'm going to give uh, Warner Brothers credit. They're the first ones that came to us and said, don't order product from us. We're going to cut off orders for indies because we want you to get the product. So order your stuff from One Stops, and there's a few of them out there. It's shitty, but at least it's honest. It gives them some time to figure out what they're doing. Or... Hopefully work on it. Yeah, at least that's in theory what they're doing. Yeah. Warner is working with those one stops to help pass some savings on so we don't have to eat it all. But there's a whole bunch of challenges that surround that. Mm-hmm. And there's even talking about uh, bigger things than just specifically independent record stores. You, you could talk about larger retails specifically. Uh, there's Amazon. Boo! Sorry, there's a, a website. That's no, it's out fine. There. It's equal to Amazon. Okay. But I'm still gonna boo them. <laughs> uh, I just don't want to trigger you. That's what tax I tax dodging, motherfuckers. Right. Uh, but even uh, Amazon, at some point, Amazon even took away vinyl pre-orders due to this issue. Yeah, they cut off buy buttons because they too, the largest retailer in the world, were not getting the product. Right. And if you don't play by Daddy's rules, Daddy gonna cut you off. And that shows how widespread the effects of this whole thing was. Can we speak about one thing you said, though? Yes. We do our best to be in line with whatever something is supposed to be. But Amazon, as a business model, regularly undervalues everything. Books, music, fucking you name it. They're undercutting the price. Because it's a, just a volume game for them. And also, there's plenty of other things in the world that make way more fucking money than music does. And movies, for that matter. So, try not to fret about stupid shit like that. Like, we do our best to be within as close as humanly possible to them. But sometimes, Amazon will literally sell things below cost just to get you to buy them. Because it's a whole different marketing opportunity for them. Selling that data, uh, offering add-ons, whatever the fuck they do, just to earn your dollars, they will literally sell things below cost. Sure. And it's fucked up. Lawsuit, you say? Apparently, I learned uh, not too long ago that in the 90s that was tried. About like you know how like video games for example I remember this have yeah. uh, like they, you know the same price everywhere or even a lot of electronics for example so somebody brought this lawsuit in the nineties and the music industry lost <laughs> so there's no price protection for consumers or retailers for that matter and now we live in a world sorry I'm gonna go it's okay I'll way out of the deep end here we live in a world now where as a store. We also have to compete with the companies that we're buying the products from. So, you know, we're not only competing with Amazon or iTunes or Spotify or whatever the fuck you want, but we're also competing with the artist's own quote unquote direct to consumer website. So, whoever, Green Day, it's not a great example, but it's an example. Green Day can launch a pre order. Days before or hours before we even find out about it. And so they obviously have the bigger reach than we do or indie retailers do in general. And so they're gathering up all those pre-orders for the same – for some version of something that we don't even have fucking access to sometimes. But the same company who's running that website and making that product is also selling product to us to sell to you. So our own suppliers are our competition – Let's go with 99% of the time. So we're not saying don't support your artists, your favorite artists or your favorite bands. Like, we get it. T-shirts are fucking cool. Those little add-ons are cool. That special variant is cool. But, you know, keep an eye out on the indie exclusive. That's our that's our weapon against all that shit. It's only at indie record stores like us across the country. 
And honestly, they do tend to be more limited than a lot of the stuff that you're getting online because that shit is pressed to order. So the indie run, like, you know, there might be 500 total, but you have no fucking idea how many people pre-ordered something on an artist's website. Sure. And I was going to say exactly that. Those indie exclusives, we appreciate all artists who who do that. Who, Absolutely. Like, who recognize, or, or the way I always looked at it is they recognize the full scope of the music industry and realize the whole, you know, all the, the parts that are involved in the whole thing. And to give a nod to indie stores, we appreciate the shit out of that. Absolutely. And there's plenty of artists and labels out there who actively think about indie stores. Right. And indie right. labels. And, like, sometimes it's not even... Like necessarily a different color or something than what you're getting on this website, but sometimes they'll give us a price break. Like they'll sell it cheaper in your retail than anywhere else because they're cool and they know it. They want to keep your local neighborhood shop thriving and going and having the next cool thing for you to go and tell all your friends about. Sure. The article kind of talks about some of the weird shit that's been happening. I was going to say, let's talk about some of these like horror stories, quote unquote, that they uh, mention in this article here. Yeah. I'm looking at. Uh well, I'll just start right with uh with ours. I'm looking at a picture of a couple records in uh, what looks like a trailer of a semi. That's right. Uh, yeah, I, I sent them this picture because <laughs> it was so goddamn funny when it happened. It's not the first time. This is the maybe the third or fourth time this has happened. So, this God, this is only like this is middle of January. <laughs> so one day we see this gigantic, you know, like 53 foot FedEx freight truck backing mm-hmm. down the the driveway here. And that doesn't happen often. Like, usually when we get freight shipments, it's record store day or, like, something particularly big, like a big event or maybe we ordered something large fixture-wise or something. But yeah. we don't get a lot of freight shipments. So I have them going, okay, what's this? And I know it wasn't for the car lot next door because it's not how you ship cars, to my understanding. Well, with all the room, you could save <laughs> now. So I go out there, and this driver's like, Dark side, I'm like, yep. And uh, he goes, I got, I got an odd one for you. I'm like, okay. So I'm standing there waiting. He goes, and there's seriously, there's like three things in this truck. You can kind of see in the photo that there's not much going on because the photo is taken right at the opening, and mm-hmm. there's like two other things in the truck. So he puts on his little forklift thing and wheels it over, and it's a whole pallet that has two boxes on it. Two boxes the size of records that has been shrink wrapped to the pallet. Yep, two boxes. And so I laugh and I I slice the plastic away and I open the boxes and between two boxes there's a total of four records, two boxes in each, and it's the Rolling Stones Let It Bleed 50th Anniversary Edition that was supposed to come out two months earlier in November. <laughs> That's right, and that's even talking about street dates, which is a big part of this discussion. Yeah, is that was one that showed up two months late, and people mentioned a couple other titles, uh, specifically Beck. Yep, was one that didn't show up until literally months after months. street date. And you know the crazy thing about Beck is, it just shows you how much they don't have their shit together at Direct Shot, and that when it didn't show up and it didn't show up, we finally went to one of the one stops when they got it way mm-hmm. late. Got a few copies that we still needed for pre-order and filled them. And so we went to Universal and canceled our back order. Can't, like, straight up cancel it. Email confirmations, canceled, order mm-hmm. done. Like, three fucking days later, we get all of our back shipment. <laughs> like, somehow canceling the order triggered them to go, oh, let's get this out the door. <laughs> yeah, and I, I have a, a friend who's in a band who was releasing an album... I guess it was late last year, and it was a whole thing where uh, I remember specifically he was like we had a whole conversation where he was telling me he was excited because he's like, you know, this might be the first record that I ever get that actually charts, and this might be the first thing that ever, you know, just to to be able to say that is is is, you know, there's like an emotional response, and he's like, I'm just excited to be able to do that, and then I remember it was getting close to street date and I happened to look in our distributor website and said the street date for the record had been pushed something like a month and a half or two months or something. And he had no idea and he was expecting it to come out on Friday. And it's a thing where, you know, he's obviously in, let's say like a mid-sized band, you know, they do a lot themselves. And so it was a thing where suddenly he's figuring out, you know, Hey, since we control, you know, the digital for it and we control, you know, uh, a lot of the shipments, do we still ship? 
Like, do we wait until the street date that it says it's supposed to be out? Do we, you know, how do we handle this? And he's, it, it, anyway, so the whole point is that it's spun this whole thing where the management wasn't fully aware of what was going on. And I was telling him about direct shot and it led to this huge conversation where in the end they, uh, I, in the end, I think what they did was they just said, screw it. We're just putting it out on the original release date as planned. We've already dumped all this marketing money into it. We have hired a publicist who's supposed to start on, on X day. So they just did it and just said, whatever, when shit gets out, it gets out. Yeah. And I can just imagine the disappointment of, you know, just having to say, I thought this was going to be a much more successful release strategy that we had, you know, put in place six months ago that now, three days before we're supposed to do it, right. we have to refigure it out from the ground up. And yeah, I can only imagine how that much that sucks for, you know, mid, mid-tier mid artists. Even anybody, like, uh, take Beck, for example. Physical is a big part of the business. Mm-hmm. Like, CDs and vinyl count for so many more like data points than your stream does i don't i'm not up on what the current equivalency is but it's an insane number of streams that you need to equal the same thing as one cd or one lp sold that album i'm gonna guess really kind of fell flat because there was no physical component to to go along with it and it's sure it's nice that at midnight on friday your album can be out digitally, and all those people who are interested in it can start streaming it. But it's not the same. It's revenue lost on so many levels, on the artist level, mm-hmm. on the distributor level, on the store level. And it's not a fair, it's not a fair fight anymore. Like we have, no, we have no chance of recourse when the album is out. And let's say an album is a dud, but suddenly those records are late to stores. So now everybody gets a chance to stream it. Our orders have already been placed. That product is non-returnable when you're talking about records. That means we cannot send it back. So we are stuck with it. And it's uh, you know, it's a weird like reverse pyramid scheme in a way. Yeah, so in the article, it says for many casual listeners, the convenience and rapid growth of streaming services has turned the physical side of the music business into an afterthought. But despite declining physical sales overall, CDs and vinyl still generate nearly a billion dollars in the USA in 2019, according to Richard Burgess, CEO of the American Association of Independent Music. That amounts to roughly one-tenth of the music industry in the United States. And at many independent labels, the physical music business is worth far more. Vinyl and CD sales account for as much as 50% of revenue for some members of that group. Vinyl in particular has been growing steadily for years now to the benefit of both major labels who released many of the popular records in 2019, but also indies. So it shows that how much... It's still a big part and an important part of the business. Yeah. Um, like, the, the conversation is always that the CD is dying or the CD is dead, but how do you say that something that's sold, like... Uh, let's say almost 9 million units last year is dead. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, even our CD sales, our new CD sales were down a little bit last year, but we're not abandoning the format. And I think it's just a change in market shift, especially because some things literally aren't even available on CD, Mm -hmm. which is crazy. They're fairly cheap to manufacture. It's a quick turnaround time. It's not nearly as complicated a process as vinyl. So come on, let's put it out there. Like, Stop taking things out of print and just put all that deep catalog back in print because the people that care about CDs now are the people that really care, and they want the deep cuts. They want the obscurities. They want the rarities. Like, There's a market for this shit. That's why you can see the used CD business is really booming and picking up, not just here but industry-wide. And even vinyl sales, I was having a conversation today. This week, like the week that just ended, the post-Valentine's Day week, is so much fucking bigger, according to SoundScan, than last year that one of our uh, distribution friends called and just kind of said, what's going on out there? Like, uh, they were specifically asked about the Tame Impala record, like, Mm -hmm. was that bigger than you thought? And I was like, well, we thought it was going to be big. We ordered a lot. But yes, it was bigger than we thought because... We are now sold out of the indie exclusive of Tame Impala, mm-hmm. which is out of print. 
and we got some of the very last copies of the regular green vinyl version coming in this week now. So I think the demand uh, far outweighed what anybody thought. And then looking at uh, new vinyl sales year to date so far, uh, he was projecting that originally that uh, the industry would see 20 million units sold this year. Mm -hmm. But he said to me, based on the numbers we're seeing so far and where they're at right now, he's now projecting 25 million units sold for the year. 5 million units of a non-returnable product for, let's say on average, cost 20 to $25. That's big numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, are we at this um, almost a tipping point where vinyl has become mainstream enough that when somebody wants a physical piece of music their first instinct is to go to vinyl i think maybe we are like i know we're a little biased because it's what we do here like in you know we've always sold more vinyl than cd but i would say lately we've been seeing more new faces in the store and our vinyl our new vinyl sales numbers seem to be up and, you know we're only a month and a half into the year but you know i'm looking more heavily at reorders lately Actually, I guess maybe the telltale sign is that we get less people in here, according to how I see it anyway. We get less people in here who come walk in the door and say, Vinyl, huh? That's still here? Records? They Records. still make them? Exactly. I feel like we get less of those and more people who come in and just shop and, you know, you enjoy know, it and appreciate it. Now that you say that, I think you're right. This, that was pretty much a daily occurrence. You could count on like one a day going, they still make records? Exactly. And the new stuff comes out? And now it's more like, hey, do you have the new Do you have the new Ariana Grande record? Mm-hmm. The new Billie Eilish record? Yeah, like, fuck Billie Eilish, man. I don't care what you think about the music. I don't really know. I Like, I've heard the singles. <laughs> I think she has a good voice. But I've never listened to the album. But mm -hmm. she's done a lot for getting kids into vinyl. And mm -hmm. that's great. Because it's like, you know, it's a stepping stone, and you're going to find the other artist. And I think when labels see something like Bailey Eilish do well, it's more incentive to put other uh, – is, is it pop music? I don't know. Sure, it's pop music. To, to put that stuff out on vinyl, where it was more niche before. Like, it was always punk and metal and hip-hop for mm -hmm, sure, mm -hmm. and like your indie rock. But it's great to see the newer, popular artists coming out almost day and date with physical product. Sure. Day and date meaning um, it all drops in the same time, digital and physical together. Sure. I mean, even that's Bill a whole different frustration, but. <laughs> Billie Eilish even put out a third man exclusive, uh, a 12 inch, a yeah. couple weeks back. That was uh, someone where she hand splattered paint on, uh, on the variant. Oh, yeah. I saw that article. And uh, so it, that even just that pairing alone, Billie Eilish with third man records is. I don't want to say it's something I never thought I'd see, but it's something that I feel like is is a good marker, a good it's indicator. Cool. You know, like it it's great that because what's the average age on a Billie Eilish uh, purchaser? I'm gonna go with for us, you know, let's say 16 to 24, and fucking and female. Like, go back. We've been doing this for nine years, and let's say you go back seven years. This is a fucking old wrinkly sausage party in here <laughs> like all everybody only wanted to talk about before was the beatles and now it's just not the case anymore mm -hmm. like the beatles are still big yeah but, we still get those guys in yeah there. there's still plenty of them <laughs> but you know there's more there's like people with real genuine awe and wonder and excitement to see whatever the fucking new release is on the, that front fixture when they walk in the door or like people have you noticed this that people like sometimes stop when they first come in like, they just sort of pause when they get through the door, and they're like, where am I? <laughs> I love that. That's cool. Yeah. Record store humble brag, you know. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I do want to bring up, though, is uh, – so there's this um, this paragraph near the end of the article where I'm quoted, and I'll, just, I'll read it verbatim. He says, as the indie community's concerns have gone unaddressed month after month, wounds have started to fester – and his conspiracy theory that the major labels are actively trying to eliminate the physical business has gained momentum. Quote me. This is me <laughs> quoted now. Quote, we know the demand is here, says Johnson, the Poughkeepsie store owner, but are they going to kill off the business? So, yes, 
I did say that, but uh, I think the context for how it was written makes it seem like I believe that there's this active conspiracy Mm -hmm. to kill the physical music business. And I can say that one was 100% not my uh, intent. And two, I do not believe that the whole thing is competent enough to have been that way. Like this thing is just a fuck up. This is a fuck up and then it broke a system that was designed 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like part of the problem with Direct Shot is that it's a warehouse that was built in the 90s for 90s CD distribution. And you know, if you were there, you remembered that the CD was king and even as late as the uh you know, mid to late 2000s, the CD was still king. Like I can remember being 16 and 17 working at FYE on new release night, which was Tuesday, better by the way. Anyway, so Monday nights. Separate article. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Monday nights we would put out all the new releases, kind of like we do here now, uh, for used twos. But we had these big carts, like the ones we have, but double wide. They were like 24 inches wide, but 36 inches long. Three or four of them fucking full of CDs. Like I can specifically remember when 50 Cent Get Rich or Die Trying came out. The FYA worked in, we had like 230 copies or something for a street date. Can you imagine? It's fucking crazy. Oh, holy shit. Like, it was an insane amount of CD. And it's just, that's not the case anymore. So that's what Direct Shot was built on. The ability to take a whole box, a box lot of CDs is 30 copies, put it on a conveyor belt, push it down the line to go on a bigger belt and get a label slapped on it. Yeah. That's not the reality anymore. People, uh, us included... A lot of things are bought in ones and twos and threes, not 30. It's more of a rarity to buy full box lots of things. You need some big name artists for things like that. Mm -hmm. You wrote a response to that, in fact, which we posted on our social media and I thought was actually very well said. Yeah, I I, I thought about it because I was was not – wasn't angry. I was a little annoyed that it made it seem like – Mm-hmm. I was pushing or peddling this conspiracy theory. You just wanted to clarify, man. Yeah, I wanted to clarify because I do know that a lot of the people that I work with, like industry-wise, are obviously going to read this article, and I wanted to make my position known. So, sure. Uh, this is what I wrote. I said, um, near the end of the article, I'm quoted about the future of the physical record business. As written, it sounds like I believe that this mess was created on purpose to kill off the physical industry, and that is certainly not the case. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I don't believe this was an active attempt to kill off physical music. Rather, I was more wondering, is there really going to be a big enough incentive to get back to where we were in terms of distribution? And I wrote that there are a lot of good people in this business who work for us and ultimately for you, our customer, uh, who make cool shit and get it into cool stores. I know they're trying, and there are advocates – but the problem is that they only have so much power to wield in a business that's dominated by digital and streaming. So those people that are at the very top, they're far removed from us, the actual retailers, and they aren't taking the long view of the business, just the immediacy of now and short-term games. Streaming is forever, right? And uh, just like downloads were before that and iPods. But despite all that, we're going to sell records We're going to get them however and wherever we can. And uh, as one indie store owner famously said, and I should have wrote it in the thing, I believe that it was John Coons of Waterloo Records in Austin, Texas, said, we're the cockroaches of of this industry. You're never getting rid of us. Well, you can go and see that Rolling Stone article. Like I said, it's on rollingstone.com, or you can head over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash darksiderecordspk. It's a, it's on all of our socials. Go give the article a read. It's a great read. There's a lot of information in there. And there's a couple other articles that have been out uh, also talking about this same thing. Yeah, if you just even want to do a general Google search, just Google, let's do it together right now. I think if you Google uh, direct shot problem, you're going to get a slew of articles. Yeah, Billboard, Billboard, Music Biz, which I also contributed to, Rolling Stone, Pitchfork, offbeat change so many so many things are out there about it it's a good read and if you want to talk about it come on in i'm happy to talk about it or leave a comment happy to respond absolutely 
And, you know, like we were saying uh, earlier in this podcast, we appreciate all of you who come in and shop here and who understand what's going on. And we do our best. Yeah. And we try to make it as seamless as possible. We're doing everything that we can to have the things you want when you want them and not have to wait for them. Like, we're trying to get them in the store on time. And I think overall, we're doing a pretty good job. Yes. Yeah. So thank you to everybody who pre-orders. Pre-orders are huge. Pre-orders are so fucking huge. <laughs> Pre-order the new Jason Isbell record. The new M. Ward from Bonnie Vare. Has the, new, new... the new Nick Mason live Pink Floyd thing. The new Strokes. The new Mac Miller coming out the day before record store day. Like, especially that one. That's going to be a fucking monster. Mm-hmm. Pre-order your video games. Come on. You know we're in the video game game now? You're buying music. It's the same price everywhere, people, because they got price protection. <laughs> they got price protection. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have a little incentive to kick off with that video game pre-order. Yeah. And I know we always say this on our podcast, but go download our app. You can shop right directly in our app. You can order directly through us. We'll have stuff here for you. We call you as soon as it gets here. And we ship so. worldwide. If you're not local, pow, right in your mailbox. We got you. Pow. Sorry, I like saying pow. Right Reminds the, me of that scene at the end of Step Brothers. Right in the kisser. <laughs> so, yeah. So, like he said, come on in. Let's talk about it. We'd love to hear what you think about it. Uh, please feel free to comment on our Facebook post when we uh, post this article or when we post this podcast for you guys to listen to. And while you're there on the internet, why not leave a nice review of our podcast? Ooh. If you enjoyed this, head on over to your iTunes store, your Google Play store, wherever it is that you get your podcast. Leave us uh, a couple stars and a couple nice words. It really helps our podcast uh, get out there and helps us expose ourselves to new listeners. To love and to be loved. Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. It's Twin Peaks Day. Oh. That's one of my favorite quotes. That's true. Twin oh, Peaks, yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's it for this one. Uh, we're going to be back shortly with uh, some fun episode stuff. we got a couple <laughs> interviews that we're going to be posting. What are you saying? This wasn't fun? We've got some Record Store Day stuff we're going to be talking about. There's mm, Coming up quick. We're getting into that season. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We have so much stuff. Thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. As always, I'm JB. And I'm JJ. It's weird calling yourself that. See you in the bits. See you in the bees.